Hello and welcome to uh, part three of the Linux Voice Introduction to Linux. Uh, in the previous part, we covered installing Linux Mint on a pretty generic PC system alongside Windows 7. Um, the very last few seconds of that left us with the boot menu. Um, so this short video is going to be about familiarizing yourself with the Linux Mint desktop and the kind of things that it's capable of and I guess recreating many of the things you may already do on your old computer. Um, my name's Graham Morrison. I'm on the team at Linux Voice. Um, and let's get started. This is the uh, login window that you'll see after selecting Linux Mint from the boot menu. Um, this, is a, this is a consequence of us choosing to not have automatic logins enabled when we installed Linux Mint. Um, if you'd enabled automatic logins, you wouldn't see this. Um, you'd just go straight to the desktop, but you'd see this if you have more than one user or if you enabled it. Um, it's also what you'll see if you log out um, and choose not to shut down. And I suppose uh, it may not be obvious, obvious, but you can shut down your system from here, shut down, suspend, and restart your machine. Um, and also you have a few more options here from this little toolbar. You can change the, the desktop software, um, software rendering is if you're having some problems with the accelerated nature of your graphics cards. Most of the time you don't have to touch this. But there may come a time when you install a different kind of desktop and this is where you choose between the ones you've got installed. Um, this option here is for selecting a language, which is useful if you are a multilingual family. Um, now let's see if we can remember our password because we quite randomly made it up at install time. It was password and a number. Yeah. Um, and this looks almost identical to when we started the live DVD installation. It's the same desktop, only now it's running off our hard drive. Um, this welcome screen here, this is different. Uh, and this is a, a small kind of initiation to welcome to you to the new Linux desktop. Um, if you used the previous version of Mint, it's quite helpful in that it shows you what new features are available and has lots of links to online forums um, and such like. Uh, of particular interest, if you like listening to music, um, these add multimedia codex button here, which is something that actually we're going to click on now. Um, you have to type in your password again because we're going to be installing some software and to do so uh, it's just the same as with other operating systems you need to give uh, the computer permission to do so. Um, the reason why the multimedia codecs aren't installed by default is that they can't be legally redistributed on the uh, DVD or as the NISO in some territories in the world. Um, a little bit incongruous that it asks you for the password twice but it had already downloaded the software and the packages um, this is the download package um, window you might get to see a lot of this you can see so it's actually downloading DVD CSS so this is to allow you to play um, commercial DVDs on your optical drive without requiring any further software. Um, and, and in fact, the, the DCSS code is, is one of those problematic pieces of software, um, especially in the US. It can cause problems. It, it's legally ambiguous as to whether you're actually bypassing copy protection um, in using the uh, DCSS code. Uh, you might also have seen there that it installed the Flash plugin, uh, which is obviously used by YouTube and uh, many other websites, although in increasingly fewer, if that's a term. Um, the Flash plugin isn't installed by default on Linux, um, unless you happen to use Google's official Chrome browser, which isn't installed by default on Mint. Um, so with that process finished, we can click on Close. Um, if you don't want to see this welcome page next time, disable that, click on Close. And here we are, here is the Linux Mint desktop. 
if you've used uh, Microsoft Windows at any time over the last uh, 20 years or even Windows 8, if you've uh, got rid of the Metro uh, skin over the top of everything, you'll be completely at home here. It works in exactly the way you'd expect. There's a launch menu down here. Um, all the various installed applications are accessible through these categorized menus. You can uh, type in to search for things. There's LibreOffice, which is the completely free open source office suite. Uh, you can also do a search for the uh, contextual words. So edit, edit brings up LibreOffice Writer, which is the, the uh, text editor, um, simply because it's actually here in the, in the text description. So you can search for application names and words that you think will be part of their descriptions. Um, one thing we like to do when we get to a fresh desktop is change the background, um, which you can do by right clicking, clicking on change the desktop background, um, and maybe choose something um, a little bit different. You can obviously add your own images um, and we'll get to that in a little bit later. In operation, it's exactly like you'd expect. This is the file manager. It opens up when you um, double click on the home icon up here. Similarly, if you double click on uh, the computer icon, it actually just takes you up in the um, so that you can actually see your various hard drives. Um, you can look at the various file system. Home, desktop, documents, music, pictures, videos, downloads. These are all folders that you have ownership over. Linux uses um, something called a home directory to store everything related to a user. So that will be your email, it'll be your internet cache and history, it'll be anything you download, it'll be photos you take off your digital cameras, everything will be stored in the home folder. There isn't anything else stored on the system. Um, so if you delete your home folder, you delete your existence on, on your computer. Um, and the home folder is here in the file system. They, there's only one user on this system, that's Linux Voice. But this Linux Voice folder contains everything. Uh, you can see there as icons, but these buttons over here, they switch between the more detailed view. You can copy and paste files. Uh, just as you would anything else with the uh, edit menu, same with folders. Um, if you do have pictures, they appear as a preview. And the first thing that lots of people want to do is uh, go on the internet. Um, and this is Firefox. It's exactly the same Firefox you get on other operating systems um, in many ways because Firefox is open source like Linux itself. Uh, Linux could be considered its native operating system. Um, so let's, let's just try YouTube and make sure that Flash is working. Game of Thrones trailer, don't want to give any spoilers. <laughs> okay, yeah, so the multimedia codecs have been installed. Um, Everything should be running as properly. We could check. We could actually check uh, MP3 playback as well because I think that's included in the uh, multimedia codecs. Let's go to a site where I know there's music. Um, and let's download Smeltine. Download this track. So this is a good opportunity to show you a bit of file management. That that MP3 file will be in our download folder. You see uh, Firefox is telling us that the download is completed. If we go to the download folder in the file manager, you should see the audio file. Um, let me just drag it over to the music folder and drop it. It'll move to there. 
There we are. Um, the music player that comes with Mint by default is called Banshee. Here it is. Um, it connects to online services uh, as well as plays your local music files. And I suppose a little bit like iTunes, it can scan your local collection. So if you have a large collection, this may take some time. Import media. Folders. Choose folders. Choose your music folder. Import. There, it's found. It's found the one track, which is the uh, track that we just downloaded it. Right. Um, next on our hit list of things to uh, talk about on the desktop. Banshee is reminding you there. There's a notification system in Mint that tells you uh, messages about the system, so we can clear that one off. Um, Banshee is actually accessible now from this small note symbol. Um, you can use this to control albums and track playbacks, or just stop that playback of that track. Okay, so uh, now we've got some music sorted out, uh, always an important part of using a computer. Let's move on to perhaps what is one of the most common uh, things you may want to do on your Mint installation, and that's to install other things. Um, Linux is different in the way that it approaches installing things to Microsoft Windows and OS X, although both of those are becoming more like Linux. Um, and in fact, if you've used a, an Android phone, smartphone, or an iPhone, um, an iOS device, you'll already be familiar with the concept that Linux uses, and that is that there is a single resource for installing apps, or we more commonly refer to them as packages in Linux, but they are essentially apps. That's because when you install an app, it has to come from a repository, uh, a server on the internet, a source of packages in, for Linux, so that it can also grab the other packages that one package may depend on. They're called a package's dependencies. That's why you normally don't download a single executable file or an install.exe file as you would in Windows. Instead, you go to a package manager and hope that your distribution includes the package that you're after. Uh, this is actually one area where Linux distributions differ um, in the repositories that they offer, the number of packages that are available for a distribution, the number of times those packages are updated over a 12-month cycle, if they're updated at all, where the security patches are provided, and also the format of the packages themselves. As we mentioned before, Mint is derived from Ubuntu and uses exactly the same package format, which they're actually they're dot .deb files, and deb stands for Debian, and Ubuntu was originally derived from Debian. Um, so while the packages aren't always compatible, they're very similar. And in fact, there's a, a Debian edition of Mint um, that does away with the Ubuntu repositories and instead replaces them with Debian, which is a, another highly respected Linux distribution. Um, but that's all background information. Um, you don't need to know any of that to know how to install packages. In fact, it's as easy as this. Uh, you go down to the launch menu uh, down here. Um, you can click on administration, which is where you'll find the stuff that deals with changing the configuration of your computer. Um, and then this being Linux, there's a choice of package managers. Synaptic is a very comprehensive package manager, perhaps not so user friendly. Software manager, on the other hand, um, is much more like the App Store interface you might be used to on your phone or a different operating system. Um, but behind the scenes, they both do exactly the same thing. You choose what you want to install. Um, and they go off and grab the dependencies and the package files, exactly the same package files. So the nice thing about Software Manager here is that you can see packages are categorized. There's uh, 43,225 packages. Um, and if, you want to, if you're interested in installing something else through a sound and video, you can click on that. You can, there's even reviews. 
um, and ratings. Um, but I think we need to install a decent uh, photo management application. Um, and well, you can easily find them. You could type in photo and see what we get. Um, Digicam, fantastic application. But uh, to go along with the desktop that uh, Mint has provided, I'm going to go with Shotwell. Um, just double click on it. Um, often you get preview images. You can see what it's like. Um, you can see that it's not installed. Uh, just click on install. It's downloading the packages from the uh, repository. Um, and behind the scenes, it'll grab whatever else is needed in much the same way that the multimedia codecs were installed at the very beginning. Um, after that's finished, it's it's in, it's it's there. You don't need to do anything. Uh, you could do the same thing with however many. It's you can spend days and weeks exploring uh, the kind of packages that a distribution like Mint offers. It's a uh, yes, it's great. It's great thing to do. Great thing. It's one of the best aspects of Linux is the amount of software available, and of course, it's all free and free. Um, so Shotwell, let's see if it's put it in here. It has. Great. Now, uh, with Shotwell installed, um, I'm going to show you another neat feature. Um, I'm going to plug in a, a, a digital camera, um, and I'll show you what happens. Camera's uh, plugged in, turned on. Right. In fact, this is a, a Canon EOS camera, uh, which I know from... Uh, my experience with OS X doesn't always have the correct drivers for it. Uh, uh, Linux is asking us what to do, and Shotwell appears in the list of applications that is compatible with it. And you can have Shotwell always open this if you wanted to. For now, I'll just click on OK. So here's uh, the digital camera, just as you would expect with something like uh, iPhoto. Um, I click on that, it starts to import thumbnail images and you can see uh, Shotwell recognizes both the raw and JPEG image formats provided by the camera which is which is excellent um, I just wait for the import to finish down here at the bottom I'll choose some uh, tasteful pictures of trees rather than embarrassing family photos let's see okay import selected Um, I'm, I'm much like with the music player, import your images, they'll be copied over to uh, to your hard drive. Uh, it says preparing to import, I just opened up the home folder. But we see we're starting to populate our file system with our own, uh, with our music and images. Um, Obviously, as these are raw files, they could be quite large. Right. Uh, looks like it's thinking about finishing the import. I think it's a combination here of uh, slow USB speed. Uh, I'll keep them. Uh, keep them on the camera rather than delete them just in case something happens here um, there you go the uh, three images that I just imported from the uh, the Canon uh, just like with anything else they they load and uh, firstly they load a preview and then they load a, a much higher detail image um, and just like with anything else, you can process them. Um, very straightforward set of controls, very similar to uh, um, Adobe's Lightroom or uh, Apple's Aperture. Um, from here, you can manage your photo collection. Uh, you can edit them um, and export them and share them. And you can see it's automatically saved those photos into a new folder with the, uh, the name and date. You can create new events and new folders here. 
Now, um, as you can probably tell, uh, we're 20 minutes into this video and it feels like we've barely scratched the surface. Um, and we don't really want these videos to become long, laboring walkthroughs of what Linux is capable of. Um, but what we do hope we've done is given you a flavor of what it's all about, the sense of adventure in playing with uh, Linux and free software applications, installing uh, your own things and making your own way. There's really nothing to be scared of or nothing to be intimidated by. It's a wonderful operating system um, and it's all there to be experienced and to play with. Uh, so thank you very much for watching uh, these three videos. Uh, let us know what new videos you'd like us to create, what kind of subjects you'd like us to cover, and we'll do our best to cover them. Don't forget to check out linuxvoice.com and the magazine if you see it in your local news agents, and have fun. Thanks. Bye.